Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Brandon, Matt's partner with Million Dollar Meme Page. <clears throat> I go ahead and introduce myself in another video. However, that's going to be on week two. So uh, I'll let you get that introduction there. And today we're going to go ahead and just jump into our first case study for week one. So every week we're going to want to do a case study on another page that we've seen come up in the, uh, the social media sphere basically based and founded on memes and how they uh, monetized and turned into multi-million dollar businesses. It's not just us. This has happened multiple, multiple times. So I think it's important for us to just show you how other people have done it because that's kind of how we got the idea to start it ourselves. So week one, we're going to get into OAF Nation. Now, <clears throat> most of you guys don't probably don't know what OAF is, but OAF is... Uh, vernacular for operator as fuck, operator referencing uh, military special operators. Nation, we have that in there because uh, they turned it into OAF Nation. It started out as operator as fuck. They changed the name later to OAF Nation, which implies community. But the other big thing that it took OAF and <laughs> took the swear word out of it, which was able for them, it allowed them to brand longer than just a meme page and then actual is military vernacular for the boss uh, i have that in there because we'll see on the next slide that um on the left we have oaf nation's facebook page and on the right we have oaf nation actual their instagram page actual and military just means it's the boss or the the main officer so that page just kind of implies that if it's coming from there it's coming from the boss the big thing that I want you to guys kind of take a look at here on the left is their Facebook. On the right is the Instagram. I kind of want you to look at their follower count. We have 500,000 followers on Facebook. We have another almost 500,000 followers on Instagram. I would imagine that there's some overlap there, but not a ton. So maybe like 50% overlap, but we can just kind of assume that they have about, you know, a million followers, 500,000 to a million. So 750 is a kind of a good guess to just kind of base off of. <clears throat> they were founded in 2013. Um, I think I watched the first uh, Operators Fuck page come up uh, late 2012. You know, they kind of did a rebranding and probably found it as a company in 2013. But this is their LinkedIn page. They have seven employees on LinkedIn. Uh, company size, they say that is 51 to 200 employees. I would venture to guess that if they actually do have 50 to 200 employees, it's going to be based on um, just the people that are like building their merch, printing t-shirts, and, uh, and fulfilling their products. Um, for the most part, just running a meme page like this, seven employees is probably uh, enough. To, to manage the day-to-day -day operations. We typically, I think we have nine employees right now, but we have a couple different pages going on. So uh, seven seems like a pretty standard what it would take to, to manage this company. But jumping into that, <clears throat> by based on our metrics, about 3% of our followers order each month. Our average order is about 20 bucks. So applying that same metric to the number of followers that OEF Nation has, we can assume they're doing about 3.2 to 6.4 million dollars a year in gross sales. Now that's not all profit, but even at a 30 to 50 percent profit, they're still doing over a million dollars a year, closer to two million. Now let's imagine out of those seven employees, we give them all six-figure salaries off of one million. Now as the owner, it's easy to sit back and just collect a million dollars a year. So we'll kind of show you how we think that that's how they did it. Um, but yeah, I, I really don't see that the guy that founded this in 2013, he's not really active in uh, managing this anymore. And we'll kind of show you what happened. <clears throat> so starting out, he started the page with memes. Now we look at this, it's, it's using this military special operations uh, culture. It's not just special operations, kind of encompassing all of the... Um, military uh, combat arms guys, people that have been deployed overseas. Matt and I both did deployments to Afghanistan. So when this came up, we both really kind of gravitated towards this. It was, it was funny. 
they were telling jokes that we understood. Um, and then also if we look at their follower account, they have 500,000 on each platform. And I guarantee you there's not 500,000 special operators that are out there following him. So a lot of this <coughs> is people want to be cool by association, but they also get the jokes. So if we look at the left, we see the special operator, they're burning trash, but in one hand he has a big stack full of cash. The other hand, he has a big wad of opium. Um, and it's just, you know, when they ask what you got into this weekend. And yeah, it's kind of like that, that hood rat. I just want to do hood rat stuff with my friends. On the right, we see a special operator with satellite communications. Him, babe, I can't talk right now, trying to establish comms so we don't die. Her, um, I just think it's funny how you can like, can't talk all of a sudden. Tell the bitch you're with, she can have you. Now, if anybody in the military can relate with that, being out working, can't, can't talk to your girlfriend, she's getting crazy because we don't have the best reputations of faithful relationships. So most of the guys in the industry can both relate with the guy on the right and the guy on the left. <clears throat> he really posted a lot of pictures of like cool military guys and contractors overseas and then and made them into memes and then he insinuated comical criminal criminal actions of the elite military special operators. So you got to kind of think about the mindset of the guys that go overseas and do these things. I mean, you have guys that are willing to leave their homes, carry machine guns, get into to fights, you know, overseas. They're usually not the most squeaky clean guys. So maybe this happened occasionally. It didn't happen. It wasn't widespread, but it was still like in the back of everybody's mind to kind of, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, marijuana plants and opium fields and, and whatnot. Tons of cash are getting moved, you know, between people. And so in the back of our minds is like, oh man, wouldn't it be funny if we just stole this money or we stole the, stole the drugs that we were, you know, confiscating or whatnot. And he's just saying the quiet part out loud. So his anonymity allowed him to basically make a really crass joke about doing illegal things. And then people shared it because we're like, oh yeah, I, I definitely thought about stealing a big couple pounds of weed and bringing it back. Um, when really most of us, nobody really did that. Maybe somebody did, but um, he's just saying the quiet part out loud. So we're, we're all like laughing and, and joking about the same stuff. As he matured as a page, and honestly, his growth was one of the most exponential growths of any page that I've ever seen. When it, it was one of the first meme pages, it was one of the first ones for this specific niche, and it exploded. And I think he had thousands and tens of thousands of followers in the first week. Um, so quickly, he realized he, he had struck gold, and he started taking pop rap culture uh, references and applying it to military special operations. And why? I mean, most of us in, you know, the military combat arms and whatever in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, I was born in the 80s. Rap kind of went mainstream in the 90s. Most of us grew up listening to rap music. So being able to take that, that it's also something that didn't really correlate with our military culture, right? It was usually clean cut white guys. And, and this guy's showing that there's really urban culture in the military and our 80s uh, global war on terror, 80s baby basically made up the, the majority of the people in the global war on terrorism. And, you know, we grew up with this, this urban influence. So see on the left has a picture of a military special operator in the back of a junky Toyota pickup truck, but they have a, uh, a fully automatic machine gun grenade launcher in the back and flood my cross with ice, getting money's my religion, got my baby mama and my side bitch kissing Theodore Roosevelt. Now, obviously, Theodore Roosevelt never said that, but that's where the comedy comes in. There's a curveball in that, and then you apply that to that, that one specific uh, situation in the military, and it, it drives this humor, and everybody's like, oh, that's funny. I'm going to share it, right? It's comical. And then we see, you know, even with urban culture, you know, always talking about the Benjamins, getting the Benjamins, and now we have a $100 bill with Benjamin Franklin, but he's got his operator helmet on with his night vision goggles and his respirator. And I think he even has a couple teardrop tattoos coming down. So really combining a lot of these cultural references that was specific for our age group of the people that went and deployed in, in 
served in the global war on terrorism. Another great pop culture reference that he brought into play was Taco Tuesday. One of the reasons I think is uh, this guy is based out of Southern California. Southern California has a couple big, large military bases with SEALs at, uh, in San Diego, and they have the, the Marines in Camp Pendleton. Tacos are super prevalent, and then even Taco Tuesday is a, a cultural, like widespread cultural thing. So whether you're in North Carolina or, or at Camp Pendleton in, in California, most mili guy, military guys that are home that aren't you know, on a deployment rotation, hey, it's Tuesday, hey, boys, let's get ready to go get some tacos and start slurping down some cervezas and margaritas. And now he's able to also add another level of comedy by using the taco emoji and making it, like, planning it where a fragmentation grenade would be. So, hey, when they forget to put guac on my order, yep, I'm just going to pull the pen and throw that taco like it's a grenade back to the, uh, back behind the bar. So, another one of the things that he did that was great was he introduced these really long captions with ironically long hashtags to increase the comedy value. So, he's telling the story, this specific one is on Valentine's Day of 2017, which apparently also fell on a Taco Tuesday. So he's like telling this story about how you're out hanging with your boys, but also you gotta hang with your girlfriend. And then he's also putting these hashtags about you know taking some smashes on the Navy and the Air Force. And uh, it was really a really good uh, for comedy. Like there's a lot of good comedy in it by, at the time, hashtags were very prevalent. So he's using these ironically long hashtags, and then he's also telling this story, you know, provocatively. And I think that another one of the really big things that led to his success with this is when we're looking at the, the algorithm of social media that's trying to keep you on the platform longer, when you're scrolling and you see that post and you wanna read this really long caption because you know it's going to be funny, it, you, it takes time and you're going to stop on that post. You're going to read the whole thing and the algorithm is going to pick up that you spent an extra long period of time on that post reading the caption before you went scrolling to the next thing. So he was able to increase his metrics on how long people spent on his, uh, on his posts, which I guarantee you, especially at that time before uh, Facebook and Instagram started becoming more woke and, you know, really not allowing a whole lot of uh, violence and, you know, pictures of guns and stuff like that. I think that really played into some of his early, his success in those early years. Continuing with the Taco Tuesday, hey, there's a guy on his deployment. In the background, he's sitting in a poppy field, so those flowers behind him is uh, where Afghan opium comes from. He's with his military working dog, but hey, the only thing on his mind is he's missing Taco Tuesday right now. So by playing into that cultural reference, he was able to start making merch that played into the cultural reference as well. Hey, we have a sugar skull, so that plays into the Hispanic and Latino culture of tacos, right? So we have the sugar skull, it's bearded like most military special operators, they're gonna have a beard and they have night vision and those aren't just regular night vision, those are the four tube night vision, which only the, the most badass units get because those things are like forty to fifty thousand dollars a piece so by buying that t-shirt i'm saying hey i like tacos hey it's cool the sugar skull is pretty cool also the dual the quad tubes are neat and uh one of the reasons we actually picked this this tank top is because matt actually has this tank top and he said he's been wearing it for taco tuesday you know for a number of years now so we I, Matt and I both have bought things from this company. Um, so it's something that like we aligned with this. Uh, we played into the cool by association type trap that he played, but also we watched it and we analyzed it and we took some of these same principles and we've applied it to our own uh, business model. Um, so I really think it's important to, for you to think about these things, look at these pages and start thinking about how you could implement these tactics and tricks to build your brand and build the success of your page. So after Taco Tuesday, he also started a Moons Out Goons Out, 
which helped tr uh, bridge a gap between special operations and the rest of the military because moons out, goons out, we see the guys on the left. I don't necessarily think those guys are anything special. They might be, um, or they might be just uh, regular infantry guys. They have their night vision on and hey, moons out, goons out. When the moon comes out, it's dark. Hey, I wore night vision. I wasn't in special operations, but you know, I've been on missions overseas at night where I had to wear my night vision. So now I get to be cool by association because I did that. That t-shirt applies to me. And then because the t-shirt applies to me, now I can relate to these other cool guys that the brand is built around. So once he, he came out with that, that t-shirt, we see it wasn't just a t-shirt. You know, he made, took that same design, made hoodies, tank tops, phone cases, coffee mugs, and that same moons out, goons out phrase, you know, that you can see other companies have basically ripped that, that phrase, put their own spin on it and made their own merch. And then down in the left, left hand corner, uh, you see the t-shirt goon. That's one of his t-shirts. Uh, you know, so now moons out, goons out turned into like, Hey, I'm a goon too. Now I can get that goon t-shirt and say that I'm a goon on the, uh, on the right. We see this uh, this Marine opening up his dress blues. I've seen similar pictures like this before where Marines will open up their dress blues and the t-shirt underneath will be the Superman. And he played into that like perfectly. Um, he's got his t-shirt underneath the dress blues. And then if you're in the culture, if you're in the military and you can read people's medals, you can tell, like I can tell because this guy is not just a basic Marine. I can tell by his rank, hey, he's made it to the rank of Staff Sergeant. He's been in for at least eight years by his hash stripes on his on his sleeve. I'm looking at his medals. Okay, he has a he has a Navy Achievement Medal with a V for Valor, which means he earned that overseas, probably while exchanging fire with the enemy. And those gold devices above it is his uh, dive bubble and his jump wings, which means he's probably either a force reconnaissance marine or he's a marine special operator. And then on his other side, I can see he's got a combat action ribbon and multiple deployment ribbons. So this guy has been there and done that, done all the cool guy stuff, and he's also wearing this guy's t-shirt. So now when I get that t-shirt, I feel almost as cool as that guy because I, he and I have bought the same t-shirt, right? So he really was able to play into that by building a brand and getting the cool people that, want, that people want to be like to wear his merchandise. <clears throat> through that he was able to build his community um, he as he transitioned out of the military and out of the operational you know jobs I think the guy that started this worked as a contractor for a while so as he was transitioning out of that he started dealing with the stuff that all of us in the military deal with whenever we transition out into a civilian role you leave the military where you're with your buddies you're with this core group of guys that you know, we eat, sleep, and drink with each other. We get in fights with each other. You know, we, we basically become a family. You leave that and you go back to your civilian life and you're feeling alone. So almost every military guy that I know of that went through this transition, when they came out into this villain world, they felt alone. But now through this brand, you know, we stand alone together. Well, now I can really align with that. Like, I want to be part of this brand because it's a way for me to reconnect with all of the same people that I used to be connected with when I was in the military. So, you know, we're all dealing with this same military transition altogether. And by building that community, I mean, it was super powerful. I, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. So, t thinking about that super powerful community, he's had a few logos. And whenever he first started his page, you know, it was operator as fuck and they had a logo and then we transitioned to OAF Nation. He took that same logo and, and we see it there on the, on the left, has the spade, the spade yeah, references. Uh, it's used a lot prevalently, like very prevalent in military special operations. Um, if you look at SOCOM and MARSOC and you know the Green Berets, they all have like some type of spade that's involved with their, their um, unit insignia. Later down the road, after he really established his brand and really got that cult following and really built that community, he came out with a new logo 
that he called the Bad Larry. And uh, one of the best things that he did with that Bad Larry is he gave the why behind it. So each part of that logo, and whether that's a spearhead on the outline or it's just a primitive version of a spade, I think it plays into it perfectly. You know, he has boob and silence, fruition, the spear is power within wisdom, survival of the fittest is the knife, savagery within reach, and the unfair advantage of uh, the brass knuckles. I think it really, really, really set the tone for what his brand was, what it meant to be o part of OAF Nation. And as soon as that new logo came out, he had such a cult following that these guys started getting tattooed on their skin. And now I don't know about you, but there's not a whole lot of companies out there that have built a brand and a cult following where you're going to get their tat get their logo tattooed on you. Like, I'm not going to go out and get an Adidas tattoo. I'm not getting a Nike tattoo. But this brand, like, I could, I could uh, relate to. I could, I could feel part of it. And we got to think, like, these aren't just guys that are sitting in their mom's basement. Some of these guys are in special operations. Most of these guys are at least combat arms in the military, you know, medics, radio operators, whatever. These are not guys that are easily impressed. And for them to go out and seek that design to get it tattooed on their body really says a lot. At this point, he's become a huge thought leader within the, the community, right? By, by establishing this brand, building the community, he's a thought leader. I mean, he's He'll be, he would say provocative things that change the way people think. He changed perceptions of what the military is. It's not just all corn-fed guys from Arkansas that are joining these units. You know, we have African Americans, we have um, Hispanics, we have Asians. We have all this, all these different types of cultures coming together, and we were all influenced by urban culture in the '80s and '90s when, and early 2000s, whenever you know rap kind of became prevalent. So he was able to change people's perception of the industry. And as such, he then like pushed the, the cult community to better itself. And the hitter feed is huge. He, he really promoted people to go out and read and do their own research, use their GI Bill, go get college, become educated. And I mean, you can see it in the quote that he puts on the hitter feed. The society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting by fools. That's kind of like his his kind of mission statement there. And we can see these articles that were in the hitter feed are all articles that are relatable to the community and that the community cares about. Like, oh, I, I want to see what the Afghan crisis is because I served there. I want to I want to see what's going on now, right? Um, I served in the Marine Corps. I want to see what the Marine Corps' identity crisis is. Hey, we had tons of guys getting blasted. A lot of guys coming home with a traumatic brain injury. This guy is a writer with TBI. He's writing an article about how he struggles being a writer with this traumatic brain injury. So the other thing that this established now is as I'm scrolling through social media, see this article. Hey, we posted this article. Link's in the bio. Now he's given me an excuse to go to his website from social media. That's huge because I can't buy any of his products unless I go to his website. So having a reason for people to go to your website that isn't necessarily just to buy merchandise is huge. We want to passively send people to the website. This is part of that funnel that Matt's talked about so many times in his lectures, right? We have the awareness done by the memes, we create that community, we establish problems, hey, here we're looking at some of these problems, you're gonna click, go over to my website to read this article, hey, while you're here, you probably align with this community, so you're either gonna buy merch, or at this point, you know, we can start looking at targeted ads to retarget people that have already visited our website and try to sell them you know, some new merchandise that's going to get them to, uh, you know, align with our brand. Like I said, these articles, they're free content for the customer. So as a customer, I don't have to pay anything to, to read these articles. 
and it drives traffic from social media to the website. And the one thing I didn't mention is that the majority of his articles weren't written by him. He got people that were part of the community that had some influence or had some different experiences that wanted to write. And they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll write an article for your website. And if I'm an up and coming writer and I have this page that has, you know, 500,000 followers on Facebook and 500,000 followers on Instagram, I would write for free just to give him my, my uh, article and have him post it on his website. Now, if I want to show people uh, if I'm trying to get a job as a writer and I want to show people my portfolio, I'm like, yeah, I, I had an article that was pu published on this guy's website on OAF Nation. Um, so a lot of these people probably wrote it for free. He might have paid for it. I know that we've paid for some articles to be written. We've written some articles ourselves for our own website. Uh, but even at 100 bucks, 100 200 even 500 bucks for an article, the amount of value that he's getting of people going to his website and establishing his brand as something more than just a meme page is huge. It's invaluable. And later, as he transitioned, mind you, like this, this page has been in existence for 10 years now. And as we get older, we're going to mature and we're not going to want to stay on just telling poop jokes or, you know, weed and opium jokes on the internet. I mean, it's one of the reasons why Matt and I are writing this e-course to, to teach what we know is because we don't want to just stay right and telling poop jokes on the internet. I mean, it's fun, but eventually, you know, you get older, you get more mature, you learn more about business, you, you just mature and you want to do more different things. Right. And so when he was transitioning to news, it was one of, one of the most interesting things I, I think is that, um, it establishes his brand as more than a meme page now. He is no longer a meme page, he's now a source of news. Now he doesn't have reporters that go out and, and actually get this. Somebody uh, <clears throat> somebody goes to Reuters and sees the news and then copies and pastes it and puts it on his website and they put a link to the original article and they give credit to the author, so it's not plagiarism, but now you're reading that article on his website. So he's you know, giving you the headlines on social media. If you want to read the article, you click it and guess what? Boom, you're right back to the website. Cookies planted. You're going to get a retargeting ad for merchandise. While writing this course, I've been looking at my phone and I am getting tons of advertisements for OAF Nation's merch because I've been going to the website, right? I've been clicking on his stuff. And so even though I wasn't even looking at the merchandise on his website, I'm now getting ads for it nonstop, and who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll go ahead and toss them a bone and order another shirt or something. But so this content writes itself; it's easily utilized for daily content. So when we're trying to hit that algorithm, we're trying to be consistent when we post. When I wake up in the morning, I don't got to think of another joke. I can just go to the news, copy paste, make a couple uh, slides on Mematic, and boom, I have content for the day that's going to do its job. And again, transitions from a funny meme page to a serious established brand that does multi -mil multiple millions of revenue every year. And it's been in existence for over 10 years now. So I think it was a really, really good play to, for him to do that. So in conclusion, he used memes and com comedy to build an audience. That's the top part of the funnel that we've always been talking about. He incorporated pop culture to kind of bridge some gaps that didn't necessarily exist before. These long captions played into the, the social media algorithm to, to kind of enhance uh, the amount that his page was shown to his audience. The merch that he made, it says that I'm cool by association. He did a great job with the, the marketing and putting that on, putting his merchandise on the right people so the other people would want to buy his merchandise. Doing that, he built the community, and then he transitioned to news for automated content. Each week, we're going to dive into another uh, meme page to kind of show you how they did that. And um, yeah, I can't wait to can't wait for you guys to come back for week two and see what we got.